All right, Matthew 27. Now this thing here says, The bodies of many of the saints that slept arose. This will be Matthew chapter 27, uh, beginning at verse uh, 51. And what happens here is this, that the crucifixion when Christ dies on the cross, uh, he's buried, there went his body. In the thy hands I came into my spirit, there went his spirit, and his soul went down. You know, his soul went down because the book of, uh, of Acts, he says, his soul was not left in hell, neither did his flesh up here see corruption. So Christ goes down here and comes back, comes up here. That's in Ephesians 4. He ascended on high and led captivity captive and gave gifts to men. Now he that ascended, what is it? But he that first descended into the lower parts of the earth and descended on high that he might fill all things. So Christ takes a trip down the underworld and comes back up. And the passage you're talking about occurs here, which are there three days in there. But because it's, because the earthquake is mentioned, it looks like they happened together, but, but look how it comes out. Uh, Matthew twenty-seven fifty-one. The veil of the temple was rent in twain from the top to the bottom. That's that veil that high priest went into. It's off of that thing every year. Now it's ripped. You know what that means is? It means you don't have no priest to go in there for you. Right. You can just walk right in. And there went your good Catholic family again. Now maybe you know some nice Catholic families, nice Catholic people, some of them are nice sweet people. And some are nice, and some of them are saved. They're good people. Some of them love the Lord. They just don't have a brain in their head. That's the problem. <laughs> They're about half crazy. <laughs> you have to go to a priest. You just, don't you know, don't you know when those old Jewish priests saw that thing split there, they had a conniption fit? I mean, after that crucifixion took place, here comes the priest back into the tabernacle. He looks through there, and here's this veil. <laughs> and he ducks back. I mean, walking there, you drop dead. See the Lord without the blood to cover you. And then he pokes his head around and looks, you know, and calls some of his buddies and they begin to look. And they tiptoe toward that thing and look on that thing there. The ark sitting there. No light. Lights are going out. Christ said, hey, I'm going to leave your house to you desolate. And he walked out the door. And they say, oh, oh. Now anybody can get in here without getting killed. We've got to cover this thing up, boys. <laughs> oh, we're going to lose our calling. Right. So ever since then, you've had those priests trying to get money from you to get you to follow them and make, make you think that they got to intercede for you. That kind of thing. you got a high priest up there in glory, yeah. and if you're saved, you're the priest. Yeah, and you don't offer a, a regular sacrifice. You offer spiritual sacrifice. First Peter chapter 2, Hebrews chapter 13. And your high priest is up there. Anybody can go in there. The Lord bless it right now and use it for your glory and honor your word for Christ's sake. Amen. I've been in and out. He said, you get this so quick, I'm already there. Right. I said to Camelite one time, I said, uh, are you saved? He said, nobody can know whether saved or die. I said, I know where I'm going, I die. He said, nobody can know. I said, you call me a liar? And he said, well, I've been taught nobody could know. I said, maybe I'm smarter than the folks taught you. Ever think about that? <laughs> you got to be crazy to them people. And he said, well, he said, uh, you, you, you know whether you're going to go to your dead. I said, I'm in heaven right now. And he said, no, you're not. I'm looking at you down here. I said, you look at my body, boy, my body. That Bible said, he that is joined to the Lord is one spirit. Yeah. That Bible said, we, present tense, are seated together with him in heavenly places. That Bible said, let us come both the throne of grace to obtain mercy. Out. I know what it says. It says, if you want to walk in, come in the front door. For me, my daddy owns that place. Down there in Pensacola, my kids don't have to knock at my door and they want to come in the office. Maybe somebody else tried making an appointment, but my kids don't. They just come right in the door. I need a security guard and a, and a chambermaid and a secretary and a door to get in. I just say good morning. <laughs> yeah, people strain. You know, when Jack Kennedy got his brain blown out down in Dallas, too bad it wasn't done sooner. But anyway, when he got killed out there in Dallas, his wife had a fit and went over the back end of that uh, car yelling, Oh God, oh God, oh God. And one wise acre noticed, he said to me, he said, You know, she didn't, he, she didn't waste time with Mary that time. She went right straight to the old man. <laughs> now that's kind of an irreverent remark, you see, I understand that. But it's interesting. I mean, when that thing happened, she didn't start saying, Hail Mary, full of grapes, blessed be the fruit of the loom, spin all the beans and that stuff. 
I mean, if that thing happened, boy, she was saying, oh God, oh God, she going right through the front door. Or trying to get through the front door. Uh, whether she got through the front door or not. But if you're saved, you're part of him and he's part of you and he's up there, so part of you is up there. All right, Matthew chapter 27, verse uh, 51. The veil was rent and twain from top to the bottom. The earth did quake. The rocks did rent. Crucifixion. The graves were open. Crucifixion. And the bodies of the saints which slept arose and came out of the graves after his resurrection. See that thing? Well, there's a thing right there where the rock shakes them loose, but the bodies don't come out until the third day. They came out and went to the holiest city and appeared unto many. Now notice it says many. Not all of them came up. Now you can be sure of one thing, all the souls went up. You had a bunch of people down here in, in paradise, Abraham's bosom, that's over in, in here in this part, where the Lord said, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, Today shalt thou be with thee in paradise. All their souls went up and Christ went up. I mean, the salvation for them is finished. They can get into heaven now. They couldn't get to heaven in the Old Testament. But it's the salvation in the Old Testament the same in the New Testament. Hey man, they didn't even go to the same place. How could they be the same? You gotta think, man. <laughs> all right, I went down, he came back up like that, and all the souls went up, but not all the bodies. He said many of the bodies showed up here. Well, I know when Christ came up in the day, he came up in this Saturday night. He crucified Wednesday, he's in that tomb all night Wednesday, all night Thursday, all night Friday. That's three nights. He's in that tomb three days. All day Thursday, all day Friday, all day Saturday. So that means he comes up at six o'clock Saturday night. He didn't mess around that garden at six o'clock Sunday morning. Grave already, he's already up. Now, as whether, I mean, soul goes down and comes back up, he's out. And he's out and walking around, and six o'clock in the morning, Mary sees him, he's been there all night. That's Saturday night. And I have never yet heard a sermon preached on it, and I've never had enough nerve to preach it myself, but I've got it in that ad lib commentary. But I got a lot of stuff on there. There's a lot of doctrine smuggled in there, you know. But, but I've never heard anybody preach on Halloween in downtown Jerusalem, you know, Saturday night. But, but isn't that a strange thing? They appeared to many. Oh, I wonder what saints they were. I've got Samuel coming up, you know, and going down to the high priest. I've got Joshua coming up and going to see Herod. <laughs> you remember what a meeting that thing would be? And they, they came up and appeared to many, his bodies, Old Testament saints. Got to walk in there, morning, good night, man. Talk about a <laughs> foul up night. And uh, those things came out of there, and they came out of there to show that uh, uh, the resurrection had taken place. And they came out of there to show the resurrection going to take place. Those are called Christ the first fruits. And take your Bible and turn to uh, 1 Corinthians. And some people think they're the 144,000 Revelation, which they might be. And I'll show you that in a minute. But get 1 Corinthians 15. Get 1 Corinthians 15. On the other hand, get Revelation chapter, Revelation is 14, yeah, Revelation 14, 1 Corinthians 15. Now here's how this resurrection works. This resurrection works like a garden. And when Paul talks about a garden, he says, uh, uh, Some man will say, With what body do the dead arise? Thou fool, that which thou sowest is not quickened except to die. And the, the body that you sow is not the seed you sow, not the body that shall be, but bare grain. And God gives it a body as it pleases him, but every man in his own order. And then he goes on down in Corinthians on it. All right, now here's this first resurrection. It's like into a garden. And the fellow says, well, how do the dead come up from the dead? What do they look like? And Paul says, you fool, my Christian expression. He says, thou fool, he says, thou which thou sowest, it's a seed, is not quickened. It doesn't germinate unless it dies. Now, you folks up here in this part of the country, probably a lot of, probably have gardens, I don't know. I'm a truck farmer myself, and I don't I do it for a living. I don't do it for selling stuff, but I've got, I've got ten vegetable beds I made myself, you know, about twenty by ten feet. I railroad ties and stuff, and I grow two crops a year. Down there, we, you can grow, you can plant twice. You plant in February, and then you plant again in September. And right now, my snow peas about that high. And I got tomatoes planted a month ago that are putting them on now. 
and they'll you can get them in before frost. And then I have a spinach this year that didn't take, but took good last year. And I've got collards and cabbages taken. And I also put carrots and beets and onions in and lettuce. My lettuce up about in here. And what I know the seed business. Now, I fell asleep one time. He said, the reason why we've got a whole nation full of atheists is because our young people have never seen God do anything. And I think that's a very interesting statement. Because you can't mess around that soil as a farmer or a gardener without believing in God. It's impossible. Because you know the explanations for it. I read all the books on it, but you can't explain it. You take a carrot seed. You ever see how small those things are? You take a carrot seed, an onion seed, or a spinach seed. Those things are so small, you can hardly hand them with a pair of tweezers. And those things, and lettuce is bad too. It's thin, like a little piece of pine needle. You take all them seeds and put them out here like this. Uh, I'll plant along about February. I'll plant potatoes. Now you can put in corn about uh, March, and then uh, and the beans in the March. Can't put in the old curdle about oh end of April. Got, ground got to be warm. You can tell when it's warm. Walk around your bare feet. It's warm up to put in the okra. I plant that stuff in the spring. Now you take all those seeds out and lay them like that on the thing there. And if you didn't weren't a gardener, didn't who was gardening, you wouldn't know what was there. Now, you get a, a, a pumpkin seed or a grapefruit seed or a, a old black-eyed pea or a crowd or a purple hull pea, some of them, them were big enough to identify. But those little dots there, and even in the big ones, if you didn't know what they were, you'd think, well, they must be awful similar. I mean, they're all about the same color. They're no bright seeds. They're all dull brown or dull gray or dull yellow or dull green or gray green or brown green, all those things sitting there. Now, uh, your farmer, you know what those things are, but if a person is looking at them, they're just a bunch of spots sitting out there. You put one of things in the ground and something goes up eight feet in the air. And there's velvet leaves to it. And if you're in a cornfield at night up in Indiana, Illinois, where they go eight feet high and, you know, 400 acres at a time, you can hear that stuff growing at night. I've heard people say you could do that, and I thought they were lying. And one night up there in Indiana, I got out of the car and walked out one movement on fields at night, and you hear them growing. The, the plants stretching, or they're growing out there in that field. Now the thing comes out here, comes a couple of things on it that long, and that, that thing that you put it down is around that thing, a hundred of them around that thing like that. Now you can explain that chlorophyll, nitrogen cycle, and all that gas. Well, what are you going to do with that? You take the other and put it in the ground and takes the vine, goes clean across that room back over here someplace, and I've come something out that I suck away. It's 40 or 50 pounds. That big full of water. How'd that water get in there? You see through the vine. You kidding? That vine isn't sticking my little finger. The thing's all full of water. You say, well, don't, don't tell me that, man. I've grown squash, and squash has a hollow stem to it. We could pick up every drop of water that came down. The hollow, the hollow stems. If a little rain, you get every drop right through there, and the squash don't get any bigger. So big, you know. Big one up in here, small one down here. And here's this watermelon with this vine, and not as big as your little finger, and it feels solid, and the thing winds up, it's all full of water. Well, I said one time, he said, God didn't know what he was doing, because he put that little thin vine, that watermelon, and he had that great big oak tree there, that little, little old nut that big on it. About that time, those acorns fell off and hit a guy, and the Christian said, aren't you glad he didn't grow watermelons and trees? <laughs> 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 now, you, now, now, now you take that thing right there, you take a little thing right there, you put one of those things down, out it comes a bunch of balls, big like a softball, the red. Then I come along cucumbers, the green. Out come this thing stuck there, yellow. Out come the onion, you start to cover it up, and the book says, don't cover it up, you pull the onion, you pull the dirt back. It's got to grow on the top. You start pulling it back off the carrots, and the book says, no, oh, you can't do it with the carrot. <laughs> you pull it back on the top, it'll get green on the top, it won't be good to eat, you've got to put dirt over it. You couldn't explain that mess with an explaining machine. Every one of those things got its own characteristics, and that pepper you pick out there has got 50 seeds in it, and any one of those 50 seeds can make a pepper plant with a pepper with 50 seeds, except it'll be 8, 9, and 10 peppers per bush, with 15 each one of them. Uh, I don't care what the chemists say. They never convinced me. You know how many people Adam had in him, inside his body? Over six billion. Yeah, how about that? 
scientific explanation, they don't explain anything. You know what these fellows do? They just assign a thing to a word to a thing so they'll know what the next time it shows up. That's all they do. They don't, don't explain anything. They can't understand nothing. I often wonder about the resurrection. What size you're going to be? I mean, he said God gives it a body that pleases him. I never planted nothing in the ground that came up the same size as what was put in. You take okra and put an old box down, here come the stalk. Keeps growing a lot October. They'll grow down there. They'll grow down there April, May, June, July, August, September, uh, October. And finally gets over your head. You're picking off these okra things off it. But you put in a thing, it, I, I'm telling you, it's not as big as your fingernail. What's all that stuff doing in that thing that isn't as big as your fingernail? Oh, microscope and the atoms and the pro, yeah, yeah, I know, you know, the cosars and the quasars and the pipsqueaks and all that kind of stuff. But all, you're not explaining it. You're just putting something there so you can tell people you know how it works. You can't explain that stuff. Now, if the resurrection is going to be like that, I don't know, man. <laughs> I don't know. But nothing comes up the size it goes down. It comes up five times as big. Ten times as big, or two hundred times as big, or five hundred times as big. <laughs> the giants in the earth in those days or something. <laughs> All right, First Corinthians fifteen. First Corinthians fifteen. Now here's this resurrection, and what is the thing like? The thing is likened to a crop. Verse twenty-three. Every man in his own order. Christ the first fruits, plural. Is the plural? Somebody came up with it. After those that are Christ that is coming, there's the rapture. Then come at the end, why he shall deliver up the kingdom of the Father. The end is the rapture going to take place after Christians are called up. Now there are three parts of that rapture. One of them is here, first fruits. One of them is there, harvest. One of them there, gleanings. And that thing there is your church age. That thing begins, Christ comes up from the dead, and the Old Testament saints come up with it. Not all the bodies come up, but the souls come up, and some of the bodies, as proof, there's going to be something over here. And then when the Lord comes, he calls us out, and out goes the body of Christ, and that's the harvest. But it's like tomatoes. Some of them get ripe first, you see, and you pick them. And then while they all get ripe, you pick them all, but you know you never get all of them. I mean, some come along later. They always do. That's the gleanings. So you have a gleaning over here. What is this? This is tribulation, saints. So the first resurrection has three parts. One, two, three. And that's why you didn't read about the first resurrection. You got to over after the tribulation. You got to Revelation chapter 20. He said, this is the first resurrection. But he didn't say if the tribulation was over. Deceptive. That makes you think Christians go through the tribulation. Ain't that a beauty? Boy, I'm telling that book and get you screwed up. <laughs> All right. There's a First resurrection has three parts. First fruits, harvest, gleaning is coming through there. And you go up in this bunch here. And that's come in before that tribulation right there. Now about these first fruits, he says here, you can pretty well see by now what I've taught you here this morning. But somewhere up until somewhere in the book of Acts, uh, everybody's waiting for the second coming to take place. And that's why Peter quotes it in Acts 2. Peter says, this is what is spoken by Joel the prophet uh, in the last days, and he starts this stuff on the tribulation. So somewhere in the book of Acts, they're waiting for the Lord to come back right then. And he doesn't come back, so it's postponed till over then. So these first fruits that come up here must have some application of tribulation. Revelation chapter 14. Revelation 14. You know, the, the, key, the key to that book is the book of Revelation. And the key to the book of Revelation is the middle chapter, Revelation 22. And if you can get Moses and Elijah placed right, Revelation chapter 11, the whole Old Testament will open up to you. Because Moses is the law and Elijah is the prophets. And when that Old Testament opens up to you, it'll open the book of Acts. Then you get the Acts straight. Then you get the book of Acts straight, you'll have your church age straight. But you never get your church age straight, you get Acts right. You never get Acts right, you get the Old Testament right. You only get the Old Testament right, you get Moses and Elijah in the right place. All it hinges on that thing. All right, I'm in Revelation chapter 14. I lift in a lamb 
stood on the Mount Zion. And with him 144,000. There's those JWs. And there's no hellers. 144,000 having his father's name written in the foreheads. So the next time when a JW comes to your house, say, would you mind taking off your hat if you got one on? And if you have one, what I want to see in your forehead is this. And if I don't see that, don't kid with me and waste my time, okay? That's called a tetragrammaton. And that thing is Jehovah's name. A Jehovah Witness got that in his forehead. He's genuine. Having his father's name in the forehead, you know. Now that thing, that's that J I was telling you about last night. It's that thing right there. And that thing is Y. Or in Spanish, H. Or in English, J. And that thing there is an H. That's a hey. And that's a vow. Sometimes spelt like that. Sometimes spelt like that. Now, if you want to see those letters, take your Bible and turn to Psalm 119. And we'll be right there in the King James Bible. Normally. Every eight verses. Aleph, Beth, Gimel, Aleph, Hey, Wow, Zion, Faith. Psalm 119. How many of you got them? Let me see your hands. Oh, it'll be Aleph, eight verses, Beth, eight verses, Gimel, eight verses, Dallas. That's your Hebrew alphabet. Well, I think if you put that thing out in English, it'd look like this. It'd look like W here, or V. Is it V-A-U in the King James? Look at the third section. V-A-U, vow. Sometimes pronounced wow. And this here is H. Now this is backwards. See, Hebrew reads from right to left. And so if you to get this in English, you'd have to have this. You'd have to have J. Or H or W. H, W, or V. H. That's called the Tetragrammaton. And that thing is the name that nobody can pronounce. So when a fellow says it Yahweh or Yahoo or Yoho or Yehi or Yehovah or Yehovah or Yahweh or Yuhu, just scratch him. You know what he's talking about anyway. How do you pronounce that? Let's see you pronounce that in this. It hadn't got any vowels in it. You can't pronounce it. Now the Masoretics put vowel points in there so you can pronounce it, but nobody knows has ever heard it pronounced. It's such a holy name that you wouldn't pronounce it. And when a Jew hit that name in his reading, is you go to a Jewish rabbi or synagogue here in town, someplace, hear him read every time he hits that word, he says Adonai, which means Lord. But that word ain't Adonai. And that ain't Elohim. That's <laughs> and when he, Moses talks to the Lord on that holy ground, the Lord says, he says, who will I say sent me? And the Lord says, tell him I am sent you. He says, my name is I am. And Moses said, why is that? And he says, I am that I am. <laughs> Would that be something you came to the guy and said, who sent you? I am sent me. Isn't that weird? Uh, you know, I, I studied Buddhism over in Tokyo for years on a Suzuki there and sat cross-legged in the bamboo mat and flipped out and framed in and framed out without drugs, you know. I mean, we, we tripped on the, on meditation, didn't have to have the drugs. And, of course, that's the hard way, but anyway, that stuff right there, when I got through studying that stuff, the thought occurred to me, Buddha says, he who knows does not say, he who says does not know, which means... When you have a transcendental experience like Nirvana or Prajna or Samadhi or Satori, one of those things, I finished this stuff before 1950. The environmentalists are just getting interested in it now. A little late, boy. <laughs> Hard to catch up. And went through this stuff. I knew what he meant. He meant when you went one of those things and tried to explain it to somebody, you can't tell what it's like because it's an out-of-the-body experience. You can't explain it because the organs for receiving the experience are still in the body. That is, my receptive organs are the eyes, and my auditory organs are my ears, and the body is still back in the chair or cross-legged in the mat, but you're out here looking back at the body. And some of you birds that mess with drugs, that's what you got into. There's a connection between rock music and drugs and Buddhism. And boy, you better believe it. But that when you can't explain it because it isn't you that's experiencing, and yet it is you, see? And that's uh, 
supposed to be the ultimate in it, you know. Uh, you take those Japanese, they, uh, they read me off pretty quick. And I read them after being them for months. But we go out and sit in those places at night. I've been out in places in Japan where if I'd been a Christian those days, I could have won Japanese to the Lord right and left. But I just lost a drop ball and horror in high weeds. And we go out and sit around these Japanese and, you know, drink sukiyaki and, you know, sake and sit around the hibachi and there would be a white man within, you know, 20 miles in any direction. I had my translator with me, Yokoi. He could speak, read, write Russian, English, and Japanese. We'd sit there, and I'd, I'm, I'm the music officer for Radio Tokyo. I'm in charge of all the music. Uh, I, I broadcast the operators and the operas and the symphonies and the concerts, all that stuff. And I get told about that, those Japs. And after about 15 minutes of talking, it got kind of quiet. And Yokoi would turn to me and he'd say, uh, Lieutenant, they say, don't talk uh, music, talk Buddha. Talk Buddha. Don't talk to me. Talk Buddha. And then we discuss Buddha. And those fellows, they knew. They knew I'd had well, an experience that some of them had been working 40 years that have never had. They knew it. And I had. But you can't describe the thing. And I remember when I was under conviction, lost, and reading a stolen Bible. That's how I got saved. I got saved for reading a stolen Bible. I stole out of a flop house. <laughs> I mean, 10 cents a bed and a can of spit in. And I've been around a while. I've been around a while. I don't know what all I've done. Seen. Sometimes it comes back to me. If I was conscious right now, standing here, of everything I've seen and done the last 79 years, I'd go off hiding in the bushes someplace, probably. I don't even know. But anyway, that, that experience right there, when I got messed in that book, I opened it one time in Exodus, and the Lord said to Moses, I am that I am. And I said to myself, looking at that thing, as an unsaved Buddhist, I said, now that is the right way to explain God, and that's the best explanation I've ever seen. You see, Buddha said if you describe God, you limit it, which is true. Do you ever, do you ever want to get close to God and then stop to think, what well, a fool you were down there getting close to a three-letter word? <laughs> Are you really close to God? What is God? I know, I know, I believe like you do. I believe Christ in me. I believe all that kind of stuff. But you ever get the, you ever stop really, you're just dealing with abstracts? You're dealing with words. I don't want to deal with words. I want to deal with Him. See? And that thing in, that thing in, 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 He says, what is God? He says, I am that I am. I said, now that, of course I didn't know I had an oriental book. <laughs> That's an oriental book. And said, I am, I said, that's the explanation. He's there just because he's there. And you can't go beyond that. You might have crack on you. You go out on the hillside at night and look up there and you're a kid, you know. There must be something behind that thing, you know. <laughs> well, it's space. How far does it go out? Oh, oh. It goes out forever. Was well, God outside it? Is he in it? If he's in it, is he a part of it? It's a pantheist, see. I'm telling you that book. Lord said, I fill heaven and earth. Does he fill heaven and earth? Sure he does. All right, am I looking at him now? Why, of course I am. He fills heaven and earth. Am I looking at him now? I can't look at him place where he isn't. Morning, Lord. <laughs> see that thing? I mean, he said, do I not fill heaven and earth? Sure he fills heaven and earth. Don't you, know, don't you know he knows what's going on in your stomach right now? How many believe he does? Let me see your hand. What a bunch of fanatical nuts, you know. <laughs> he knows what's going on under that bench right now in front of you. The eye of Lord every, I mean, I fill heaven and earth, what he said. See, well, how is you can't see him? He hides himself. He's unrevealed. He wouldn't dare expose himself. You say, why not? He blow us to smithereens. <laughs> you know why the Lord doesn't reveal himself right here now like he did in the third heaven to John? Because we don't burn to a crisp. <laughs> he's, he's through that thing and in that thing, but he's not part of that thing. Well, then he's outside of space. Outside of space? <laughs> well, now what room does he take up? Out to where? Well, what's beyond where? You know, or you know, right for a straitjacket. <laughs> Now, the best thing is, I am that I am. Now, sitting right there, that can be 
Jehovah, depending upon what you put in here, this would be a V stuck up in there. Jehovah, or it could be Hey, Ho, Ba, or it can be Yeah, Ho, Ba, or it can be uh, Joe, He, Wo, Bo, Wo, or Joe, He, Wa, or Ha, 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 Ya, Hu, Ya, you get finally get Yahweh, W A H E W. How many ever seen that around anywhere? Yahweh. That's the latest thing in the prisons, the, the Yahweh stuff. It's, they don't know what they're talking about. Jehovah's just good as any of them. You put any vowels in there. Nobody knows the name. But it's I am and I am. All right, 14. The Father's name. And I heard a voice from heaven as the voice of many waters and the voice of great thunders. Verse 3. And they sung as it were a new song before the throne. And before the four beasts and the elders, and no man could learn the psalm of 144,000. Four. These are they which were not defiled with women, for they are virgins. These are they which followed the Lamb with the strength they goeth. Watch it. These were deemed among men, being the first fruits unto God and to the Lamb. Now, what that means probably, I don't know this for sure, but it means probably that when Christ rose from the dead, the, the, when he said many of the bodies of such saints has left arose, and it come to something like 144,000, and the other eight or nine or ten million never bodies never showed up. But these bodies go up with him here like this because in the tribulation they're coming back down and they'll be witness in the tribulation. Now if that's wild, you know who was back here in the Old Testament and uh, was uh, buried. And then taken out of the grave, and then taken to heaven, and preserved to come back down again. Moses. Moses. He dies, he's buried, he's hauled up, shows him out of transfiguration. Revelation 11. You get that right, you get Revelation right, you get that right, you get the Old Testament right, you get the Old Testament right, you get the book of Acts right. Moses comes back in the tribulation. 